Good evening and welcome to Leesville First Baptist Church. We're starting a new Bible study tonight from the uh, book of Jude. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Lord, we thank you for the ability to study your word. For the abundance of wisdom and mercy and help we find in your, in your holy word. Your word teaches us how to live. Your word teaches us who we are. Your word teaches us who you are. Help us to know the meaning of your word. Help us to grow to be like Jesus. Use your word to sanctify us and also to equip us. For Lord, we know we live in dark times in a dark and cold and miserable world that needs to know Jesus. Lead us to be light bringers in the darkness, to bring holy fire to warm those who are cold and to announce your love to a miserable people. Give us revival because Lord, we cannot involve ourselves in such a heavenly mission with the sins and the sinfulness that we, we tolerate in our own life today. Help us to repent. Show us our sin. Help us to be right with you so that we might be fit vessels to carry your glory. Lord, we pray for peace for our nation and for our world. Let your peace bless all the people and again use us for that work. For we pray in Jesus' name who died for the sins of all for the salvation of all. Amen. The letter starts Jude. It's actually Judas. But after the infamous Judas Iscariot, the Bible writers did not, did not want to slander this Judas. So they call him Jude instead. There's an argument about who he is. The two main theories are he's Judas, an apostle, or that he's the half-brother of Jesus. The reason they believe he's an apostle is because he doesn't call himself the brother of Jesus. Well, humility may be the reason for that. The reason I think he's Jude the half-brother of Jesus and brother of James, who's the half-brother of Jesus, is because he doesn't announce himself as an apostle, and that was traditional in that day. If an apostle wrote a letter, he introduced himself as an apostle. Jude doesn't do this. So Jude, a bondservant of Jesus, now bondservant is a voluntary slave. It was a common term then for someone who was Christian. I have chosen to be the servant of Jesus is what, the, what it means. A bond servant of Jesus Christ, brother of James. To those who are sanctified by God the Father. He's talking to the entire church. Not one church. Paul would write letters to a particular church. 
the letter to Ephesians was written to the church at Ephesus. The, the letter to the Philippians was built, was written to Philippi. This is written to all Christians. It's a universal letter. It, if you want to say it's written to a church, it's written to the church, capital C, capital C the entire Christian world. To those who are called, another name for the church is the called. The, the Greek word for that day, ekklesia, meant those who were called out. Called out of the world, called into the kingdom of God. Into an identity as the people of God. So we are called. We are different from the world. The Christian doesn't belong in the world. He lives here, but he doesn't belong To those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. In other words, saved. Three ideas, three facets of salvation. Is that we are called by God, that we are sanctified by the Holy Spirit. God is working in my life daily, we are able to say. And that we are preserved in Jesus Christ. Preserved by Jesus Christ. I am saved, I am saved, I am saved because Jesus has my heart. He owns it, and he's in my heart. Can you say those three things? Have you accepted the call of Jesus Christ to come out of sin and out of the world into his marvelous light? Are you cognizant of the work of the Holy Spirit in your life to sanctify you? And do you know that you're held in the hands of God through Jesus Christ? Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Now, the word mercy in um, Hebrew, ruhama, meant, had a double meaning. It meant mercy, of course, but it also meant the particular people of God. It was part of the identity of Israel. We are the, the ones who've received mercy. And Hosea, it's such a big deal when he calls one of his children, lo ruhama, lo meaning no, no mercy. Because it not only meant God's wrath was coming, but it also meant you're not my people. You don't belong to me. Now, the second child doubled that meaning. Lo, Ami. Ami means people, my people. Lo, not. So part of the identity of the Israelites, part of their self-understanding, was that they were the people who received mercy. And Jude is using that. He, of course, is a Jewish Christian. Speaking to a world that is still at this point half Jewish, half Gentile. So they would understand when he, called, when he blesses them with mercy, he's using part of the identity of a Christian, identity of a person of God. You've received mercy. Do you know that you've received mercy? You did not earn your salvation. Sometimes we who have been Christian for a long time begin to think we deserve it that we earned it. Sometimes that happens because we forget that we were once sinners. Truth is, we are always sinners saved by grace. If we ever get too full of ourselves, we need to remind ourselves we are sinners saved by grace. We didn't earn this. You didn't earn your salvation. You are the recipient of mercy, the mercy of God. Peace. When Jesus reappeared to his disciples in the upper room, he breathed on them and said, peace be unto you. The peace of God 
which passes all understanding. It's beyond what we can fathom, but it's real. And I honestly believe we'll spend eternity trying to fathom the peace of God. It's a peace that means that I'm right with God. It means that I know my sins have been atoned for. It means I know that the battle is over and I already had the victory. Yes, I'm going to continue to struggle against sin and against my own base instincts. But I know that God has won the victory for me through Jesus Christ. And I am well cared for. I know the presence of the Holy Spirit today, so I know that God has never left me and will never leave me. Do you have that peace? Do you know that you're saved? Do you know that you're in the hand of God? You know, sometimes the doctor gives us a death sentence. And we begin to think that God is a million miles away. Or our spouse walks out. Or our children suffer. Do you know that you are in the hand of God no matter what happens? That the worst thing the devil can do to you is kill you. But then you'll just go to heaven earlier. Do you know that you are in the hand of God? Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Both the love of God given to us, but also the love that is commanded from us. We are commanded to love one another. And we know that we ought to love the lost as Christ loves the lost. These three things the mercy of God, the peace of God, and the love of God to us and out of us be multiplied to you. I pray that you have it, and I pray you have it in abundance. That is a sweet beginning of a letter. And it teaches us who we are to a degree. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you, now in the Greek, he says, while I was fast to write to you. The word diligent is actually the word speed. It was a Greek idiom, and it meant devotion. It meant intensity. It meant urgency. I'm not just writing a letter to you. I am writing it hard and fast. I am deep in my study. I have been lost in my contemplation. I am working overtime writing this letter to you. This letter is of utmost importance to me. While I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I was going to write to you about what it means to be saved, about what the working out of Christianity means. He's saying I was going to write you a general letter about Christianity. I found it necessary, while I was doing that, I found it necessary to write to you instead, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. As I was thinking about writing to you a letter about general Christianity, I realized what I really need to write to you is a letter that you fight to keep the gospel pure that you contend for the faith. And not just that you contend, but that you do it earnestly, which means with sincerity and diligence. We have an obligation to keep the gospel pure. There are always people who want to taint it, twist it, abuse it, refuse it. And it's your and my job to make sure that the gospel is held pure. 
in your home, in your marriage. How many of us let our children believe the wrong thing? How many of us let our children follow a false god? Thinking, well, the preacher will teach my child. The Sunday school teacher will teach my child. Jude says, I realize I need to write a letter asking all, to all Christians, asking all Christians to fight for the purity of the gospel. The one that was delivered once for all. Jesus died one time for all time. Jesus died for everybody, once. And it was, this was the message that was delivered to, those who, to the saints, to those who were saved. The word saint in the New Testament means Christians. I know what, for example, Catholics teach that saints are special people above and beyond, but no. The word saint in your New Testament means every Christian. For certain men have crept in unnoticed. Now, let me stop here. Jude is writing about 25 years before John wrote his, his three letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. John wrote about, like I said, two decades, 25 years later, because it had become a big deal, namely Gnosticism, uh, a Greek philosophy based on the idea that there were two realities, the physical and the spiritual, and that the two were separate. The physical was evil and the spiritual was good. Therefore, only the spiritual mattered. But we find here Jude is saying it's already starting. Now, Later on, John's going to call this the spirit of the Antichrist. These certain men then are Antichristoi. They are Antichrists. They're part of the movement. You didn't think Christianity was going to emerge without Satan trying to either kill it or pervert it. The devil works in your life. If he, can't get you, if he can't keep you lost, he wants to make you defeated. He wants you so tied up in sin in the guilt, and then the guilt of sin that you are filled with despair and you're a defeated human being. Certain men have crept in into the church. He's talking about preachers, Bible teachers. Unnoticed, they slipped in without announcing who they were. Who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. This is part of a demonic conspiracy to destroy the church. The church universal faces this problem and each individual church sees it. Some of these men and women who come in teaching false doctrine are evil some of them are ignorant, but well-meaning. They just don't know that they're wrong. Who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Again, the demonic conspiracy. Ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness. Now, don't ask me why, but every time you see a A heresy. Every time you see a group break off from the church, you will see sexual immorality. Whether it's Brigham Young telling all his deacons that he wanted their wives, or David Koresh telling his supporters he wanted all the women. For some reason, when someone's, when a man or a woman starts a brand new religion that twists off of the church, they always get caught up in filthiness, sexual filthiness. Lewdness. 
Jude calls it here. Which means filthiness. To be corrupted, to be polluted. These are polluted men. That's part one. And number two, and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. You, you might want to ask, well, what are they doing in the church if they don't believe in God and they don't believe in Jesus? Well, they shouldn't be here. But they are men of appetite. Paul says their God is their bellies. They want what they can get out of church. They want the people there. There was a church not too long ago that had a, and I won't say where, but they had a ministry to divorced people. Wonderful idea. But evil men moved into that class, realizing that the women there were vulnerable. Furthermore, the women would trust a man in church when they might have, those, that woman might have her guard up out in the world. So by going to that Bible study, that class, they were able to take advantage of people. Wolves always want to go where there are sheep. They deny God. They deny Jesus because if they believed, they would know that they were damned. They would know that they were wrong. In order to hold on to what they've, they've created, they have to ignore God. That's not as cut and dried as you might think it is. It's possible for a well-meaning Southern Baptist to go to church and after a while worship a religion that has nothing to do with Jesus, that has nothing to do with God. We worship false gods even in church. We worship money. My parents were part of a church once where they were informed that the mayor, the head of the, the owner of the bank and the most important people in, in town were allowed to sit on the right side. There was an aisle down the middle. Everyone else had to sit on the left side. They worshiped money at that church. There are people who worship gods that are so subtle that even you and I might actually be attracted. Maybe you're attracted to a church because it's popular. Maybe you're attracted because it's entertaining. If you think about it, it's easy to worship in a lot of churches for the wrong reason. This is what empowers these godless men. The fact that there are other people there who are of a like mind. And as they start to speak, they're people who agree. This is insidious. This is not a flood that we can fight against, but it's a drip, drip, drip of apostasy that slowly soaks us and Jude says we need to talk about it. But I want to remind you, verse 5, though you once knew this, if, you, if you're like me, you detect a little bit of bitterness there. Y'all used to know, but now you're getting confused is what he's saying. I want to remind you that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. You realize that's true. He carried them out of Egypt on the back of 10 miraculous plagues against the people of Egypt. They saw the miracle of God. They had painted their lentils with lamb's blood to protect their firstborn while they watched their neighbors lose theirs. They saw the pillar of cloud 
by day and the pillar of fire by night. They saw the parting of the Red Sea. They'd eaten the manna. And yet they still rebelled against God and God had to destroy them. So Jude is saying here, just because you're a card-carrying member of your church, you're a member in good standing, doesn't mean that you're allowed to disbelieve. Doesn't mean that we can give up the faith and turn our church into a social club instead of the house of God. And the angels, not only did the Israelites face disaster, or some of them, the angels who did not keep their proper domain, the Bible tells us that one third of the angels joined with Satan to rebel against God. He's talking about these angels here in verse six, the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, they left heaven. Isn't sin amazing? When you boil it down, isn't sin just the dumbest thing? That an angel would leave the glories of heaven for the perversions of hell. But then I think about the prodigal son who did the same thing. He left his father's house and ended up slopping hogs working in a pig pen, wishing he could eat the slop that the pigs were eating. They had all the benefits of heaven, these angels did, and they still rebelled against God. He's saying, don't believe that just because you're in church that you'll never disobey, that you'll never walk away. I know I believe that once saved, always saved. But there are people in every church who think they're saved and they're not. Jesus is clear on that. He says there'll be many people who will call him Lord, Lord, and say, didn't I do this for you and didn't I do that for you? And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. You were never saved. We never had a relationship. So Jude is saying, be careful. I want you to fight for the faith, but first I want you to fight for the faith in your own life and make sure you're right. Those angels, I'm still going to read verse 6, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Jesus describes hell as the utter darkness. And the demons in hell are subject to that now. They're in chains in darkness, waiting for judgment day. And after judgment day, they'll be tossed into the lake of fire. Verse 7, third example. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a, in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality, there we are again. Sigmund Freud says that sex is tied to our survival instinct. And it is as important, as urgent to us as breathing. So it's only reasonable, I guess, that when we leave the kingdom of God and go off into the world, that we become slaves to sexual sin. Sodom and Gomorrah, were exceedingly sexually wicked. I say that with a little bit of chagrin because I look at our television. I look at our internet. I look at our daily speech sometimes. And I realize how sexualized we have become. We won't even let children stay children. But there are people who insist on sexually indoctrinating our children at the youngest ages. Not, ha not satisfied with their own perversion. They want to force it on children. 
instead of just leaving a child alone to grow up. That's what he means here, having given themselves over to sexual immorality. You understand, these ones who would do indoctrinate the world, who would make everyone to be over-sexualized the way they are. Now let me be careful. Sex is a gift from God. And in marriage, we're told in Hebrews, it's undefiled. The marriage bed is undefiled. It is a glorious gift in marriage. But outside of marriage, it is twisted. It is selfish. And it leads to excess. In this case, he said they gave themselves over to sexual morality. They became slaves of it. They couldn't help themselves. That's why, like an alcoholic who tries to push alcohol on other people to get them to drink with him, these people are slaves to sexual immorality. And they want everyone else to tell them that their perversion is okay. Given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh. Now, the traditional meaning of that is homosexuality. But it also means anything other than your spouse. These are set forth as an example. Suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So, the angels, the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, are all waiting for judgment. He's literally saying turn or burn. He's saying some within our churches are lost and they need to get right. And that they know, one way to know that you're lost is if you're tied, if you're trapped in sexual immorality. If it leads you to twist scripture if it leads you away from the gospel. Sometimes it's not what we do either. Jesus says if you look after a woman, to look at a woman to lust after her in your own heart, you've already committed adultery. Some of us, the sexual immorality we've given ourselves over to is all up here. But if you're consumed with it, if you're driven by it, do you not understand you're in the same boat? And the only difference is you say you would if you could, but you don't feel you can get away with it. Verse 8, likewise, also these dreamers, so these dreamers, these certain men who crept in unnoticed earlier, are like the rebellious people of Israel who were who had the, the land opened up to swallow them. Like the angels who are in chains in hell. Like the people of Sodom and Gomorrah who face fire and brimstone. These dreamers, a new, another a new de definition of them or description of them. They're dreamers. What they're saying is not right. They're preaching fantasies. How do I know? I've been talking about how to know it in your own heart, but how do I recognize it in the preacher, in the Bible teacher? Maybe he's on television. Maybe you're reading his book or her book. Not only are they given over to sexual immorality, which you may or may not find out about, but they are fantas they are full of fantasy. They dream up exotic gospels rather than believe the one true gospel that we've already had delivered to us. They defile the flesh in the same way that Sodom and Gomorrah defiled their flesh. In the same way we understand that the Israelites who rebelled 
were involved in sexual immorality. In the same way we know that the, the devils, the demons in hell, have perverted their souls. These dreamers defile their flesh. Reject authority. Now that's hard because America today, the, the basic spirit we have as a nation is to reject authority. I remember one time watching, I believe it was ABC, a, a Saturday morning children's program. And it was, the, the program was titled something along the lines of um, sarcastic answers to dumb adult questions. We teach our children to reject authority. We teach them not to respect the teacher, not to respect the preacher, not to respect the policeman. We teach them not to respect the elderly. And we have watched our society suffer because if you can't respect the wisdom of others, you can't respect your own wisdom. They defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Now, literally, that word dignitary in the um, Greek is the word glorious ones. It means leaders. There's no pride in it for me. There's no glory in it for me to speak well of good men, they think. But I can get a lot of glory if I can find something to criticize a big man about. And the bigger he is, they think, the more glory they get when they tear him down. I hear this. It's a temptation we all face. I've heard young preachers stand up and say, Bible doctrines that everyone gets wrong. What they're really saying is, Bible doctrines that everyone gets wrong but me. And then they will take a giant of our faith like Billy Graham and tear into certain words he said, even twisting them where common sense shows the twist is unmerited. But they do it for pride so that they can stand above these dignitaries. So here are three marks of these false preachers or these false teachers. They are defiled in the flesh. They reject authority because if they respected authority, they'd have to admit that what they're saying is wrong. And they speak if evil of dignitaries, trying to elevate themselves by putting down a great person. Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses after Moses, was, Moses died, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but st said instead, the Lord rebuke you. I'm not going to rebuke you. God rebukes you. It's hard not to get on our, our, our high horse and condemn. But the lesson here is, let the word of God speak. Let the will of God be known. Hold yourself and others to the standard of God, not to your standard. Verse 10, but these, these, these evil teachers and preachers speak evil of whatever they do not know. They condemn things they don't even understand. I've listened to politicians make me gnash my teeth as they try to condemn Christians using the Bible in stupid ways. They don't realize, I guess, what fools they make of themselves. Like the one politician who called himself a study of, uh, student of the Bible. And when he was asked what his favorite book in the New Testament was, he said, Job. Over and over, they speak evil of what they don't know. 
people stand up and say, how dare you call yourself a Christian and vote this way or vote that way? And I want to ask, are you a born-again believer in Jesus Christ? Do you even know what you're talking about? But the spirit of the Antichrist fills people with this understanding or this belief that they understand Christianity better than Christians do. And whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts, in these things they corrupt themselves. They condemn what they don't understand, and then they give in to their physical, their base instincts, like brute beasts, like stupid animals. And they corrupt themselves, they twist themselves, acting like animals. Woe to them. Now here's the first prophetic word. Woe to them. I love the word woe. I know I mentioned it in, in Revelation, but it's the Hebrew word oi. And it's a it's a cry of pain, of frustration, of judgment of misery, oi, and that's the word woe, oi to them. Boy, are they in for it. What misery is coming their way. He spent a, he spent a good while identifying them, and now he's telling you what's coming, for, what's coming to them, boy. For they have gone in the way of Cain. He's still identifying these people. And here, the first characteristic is that they're like Cain. Well, what was Cain's way? Well, first of all, he wanted to get out of cheap, get out, get along, or get by with cheap worship. He didn't give his best to God when he sacrificed. The reason he hated his brother was because his brother did give of his best, and in doing so, in contrast, Cain looked bad. Cain killed his brother by jealousy. How dare you make me look bad? One of the directions we see, one, another of the identifiers of these people is that they're jealous when real Christians stand up, when real Christian doctrine is preached. They're angry about it because it makes them look bad. Secondly, have run greedily in the era of Balaam. You may remember Balaam was the prophet who was hired to curse the Israelites. And instead, an angel of the Lord appeared. He was seen only by his, his donkey at first. And then finally Balaam was able to see him. What a horrible thing for a man of God to work for the devil as long as he gets paid for it. Give me enough money, he says, and I will twist the, the glory of God into a curse. It's the grace of God that he wasn't allowed to do it. But these false teachers are jealous of Christians, and secondly, they're greedy. They're in it for the money. You know, an honest pastor finds it hard to get rich. But there are criminals who get into the church, and they can make millions. And thirdly, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Korah was the rich man who was among, a member of the Israelites when they were uh, leaving Egypt. And he was a little bit upset about the fact that with all his money and with all his affluence, he was given a small job and others had better than he got. And so he led a rebellion. He basically tried to raise um, a group of people to rebel against Moses and he wanted to take over for Moses. It was going to be his people. As I mentioned earlier, Moses had them separate. 
and by who's on Cora's side stand over here by his tent. Everyone else better get away. And the earth opened up and they went to the grave, the Bible says, while they were still alive. Three, we end then with three descriptors that we need to be careful of. We don't want to be these people. We don't want to be the ones who hate our, our Christian brother because he's really Christian and we're not. Like Cain. We don't want to be in church for the profit we get. And we don't want to rebel against God because we want better than what he's given us. The, the name for this apostasy, this heresy, was called Gnosticism, as I mentioned earlier. It was people who were told that they could give you a secret bit of knowledge. Gnosis means knowledge. These were people who were initiated into a mystical group, mystical cult, by being given some hidden knowledge. So esoteric knowledge that made them better. It became attractive to a lot of people. A lot of young men would say, well, if there's, if there's more to this, I want to hear it. I want to know the secret words. I want to know the secret powers. But it was demonic. It was a plot from hell to destroy the church by corrupting it. And it exists today. Because it spiritualizes everything, it believes that there is no such thing as physical sin for a Christian. Because we're in the world of the spiritual. That means they teach we can do any sexual sin we want to. Now that's about as dumb as the husband who tells his wife when he has an affair, but honey, it was just it was just physical. I love you. She was just there. She means nothing to me. The wife would beg to differ. God begs to differ. We can't say that because I'm spiritual, I can do any physical sin I want. And yet I tell you, there are people who try to do that today, try to believe that today. That is the spirit of the Antichrist that Jude is writing against that we still face today. And the only answer, and this is why he said this was going to be the subject of his letter, we need to fight for the faith. We need to make sure of what we believe, fight in our own heart that we believe properly. And then we need to stand up for it in church and in the world. As I mentioned a few weeks ago, the old Southern Baptist tradition of an altar Bible opened up, meant that you could stand up and point to scripture if ever you had a Bible teacher who tried to go astray. We're not talking about fighting authority here. We're not talking about rejecting authority. We're not talking about warfare in the church. We're talking about purity. Private, quiet, decent, purity. We'll talk about it more next week. But for now, let's stop and ask, am I right with God? Do I know the gospel? And do I further it or do I hinder it? Let's think of that this week. Until next week. As always, in Christ's service and in yours, I am your pastor. Good night.